I have the challenging task of drawing the conclusions of this very rich panel. And first of all, I would like to thank all, all our panelists for their contribution today. And uh, I think they gave excellent examples of the different ways in which uh, a government can be increasingly hostile to the idea of human rights or even to the to human rights organizations. And as uh, Matteo already said, uh, um, this event was very well timed uh, in the sense that uh, today in the morning when I woke up, uh, the news uh, the news were on 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 the front page uh, that uh, the uh, the list of NGOs came out. Uh, that serve as a reason to the government why they are attacking the Norwegian civil front. And actually I felt strangely proud because the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union was listed on that. And the project why we are being attacked or why the Norwegian civil fund is being attacked is because we have this project through which we would like to distribute our good practices in defending fundamental human rights to other civil society organizations, to teach them how to do it, how to be um, how to deliver your message, how to defend your case at the court. And it makes me really proud because it really shows the importance of, of the work what we are doing. Um, First, I will just say quick, some quick examples from the presentations and then talk about the international standards and then also try to cluster into the different types of uh, attacks and attempts of, of restrictions uh, that we heard about today. And then I, I uh, drew some uh, conclusions about the challenges that we are facing. They are very interlinked, so excuse me, they won't be so shiny and really easily uh, uh, divided. But, uh, they, but they really show how, how interlinked our work is. So first we heard about uh, Istvan Rev, about, about uh, how populist governments can speak about uh, the unity of the nation, of the Hungarian people in the case of Hungary, and uh, in this way try to jeopardize uh, the reputation of human rights organizations. And then we heard uh, about Belarus from Miklos Harasti, where every public act Every public um, action uh, needs permission, and this permission is often denied. Thus, those who, who still are willing to, uh, to publicly protest or publicly um, demand something, then they are criminalized. And then we went to Egypt on, in, in one of our first uh, country examples, where uh, the police raided the offices of, uh, of our uh, organization, the, the Egyptian uh, organization that is also a member of, uh, of INCLO. And then we heard from Russia, where, uh, where uh, Pavel Chikov shared with us uh, that uh, actually a simple complaint to the to the United Nations, or one of the United Nations uh, department can be characterized as a treason by the, by, the, by the Russian government, so human rights activists can be held accountable criminally. And then we went to, to the land of freedom, to the United States, where we think that everything is so shiny, and heard about how the government, without uh, uh, even considering the rule of law, without a trial, without a judge, uh, ruled about the assassination of an American citizen. And then we, we visited Israel, uh, where, where uh, a very, very familiar thing happened, that there, were, there was an activist Supreme Court which, uh, which uh, protected the rights of, of citizens, but this, this, oh, sorry. But, uh, this resulted in curtailing its powers. And then we arrived to Hungary, uh, that is all so familiar to us, and, and heard about, for example, the, the unjustifiable restrictions to the freedom of speech, that, which have a clear chilling effect on, on the Hungarian media. And I think this is also clearly shown uh, by today, when the, the turnout from the press was relatively low, and. Um, and it, it really shows how, how this chilling effect can work um, 
because uh, with our issues that uh, was clearly shown today, it's not only affecting civil society organizations, but also, also independent journalism and the press, uh, there's, there was only very few journalists who was, who was interested in this issue. So let's talk about uh, the international standards a little bit. Uh, Istvan Rev also mentioned that the democracy for us is all, must be all too important to be left to politicians. And I couldn't agree more with this statement. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and of Association uh, published recently a publication about uh, the attempts to silence civil society organizations and how this constitutes a freedom of uh, association question. He identifies the right to funding from domestic, foreign and international entities as, a cru as crucial to civil society and recommend the, recommends the states to, inc uh, to respect this. He also talks about defamatory practices, stigmatization of civil society organizations as an attempt to stigmatize civil society and to discredit us. Such attempts can seriously harm the fundraising potential from individual donors and might impact policies of foundations as well, moving to the direction of supporting non-offensive strategies. This was also pointed out for, uh, by the UN Special Rapporteur, which is especially harmful for organizations as the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union, which uh, prides itself in, in, uh, in applying offensive strategies in, in the protection of fundamental human human rights and the rule of law. And uh, finally from Navi Pillai, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, she stated that the dynamic, diverse and independent civil society is a key element in securing sustainable human rights protection in all regions in the world. He, she expressed deep concerns about moves to curtail the freedom of NGOs and other civil society actors to operate independently and effectively. She even stated that, as we have heard today, civil society in a democratic society is a fundamental check and balance to the government's power. Um, I will uh, shortly um, cluster the types of, um, of restrictions and attempts that were heard today and also on, based on the levels of severity and the type the, on, based on the le level of severity, uh, we can talk about the, those attempts that, uh, uh, that affect civil society and human rights organizations that are rhetorical. Uh, the stigmatization of human rights organizations, I, I think it's an ex excellent example of this. We heard about this from many different angles. First about how uh, the, the human rights organizations uh, activity h harms national interest. In, in the rhetoric of the government, how it is serving foreign interests instead of the national interest, or even hinders the fight on terrorism in certain cases. Another category is, are the administrative barriers. We heard about how NGOs have to register and then re-register and then re-re-register um, in order to, to operate. And we heard long about the legal obstacles that, uh, that uh, civil society and human rights organizations can face. As uh, Istvan Rev and uh, Anthony Romero put it, when the rule of law becomes the law of rule, there's a huge problem for, for civil society. Uh, and when pu public acts, uh, such as political opposition, requires permission or are, uh, or, uh, are under outright ban, or under criminalization, there are serious problems for those who would like to defend fundamental human rights and the rule of law. And we can also talk about um, activities, raids that attack the, uh, the property of civil society, which is also crucial to our work, let's not, let's not forget that. And then, finally, about personal threats. They can either come from the government, on the one hand, uh, Miklos Harasti talked about how uh, people are framed for hooliganism in Bel Belarus uh, and then tried and uh, charged with criminal sentences. But um, I, I would add also that the stigmatization of civil society and human rights uh, activists can also lead to personal threats and personal attacks uh, by fellow citizens. 
when we talk about the types of restrictions or silencing attempts, we can, we can find at least five, at least I, I could find five after listening to today's uh, presentations. One is the discrediting of the work of the organization, and then closing communication channels, attempting to mute the organization, closing down all that channels that, through which we can uh, disseminate our messages. And then uh, ra raising legal and administrative barriers to the operation or of, of, um, of the organization is an, another type. If you just talk about uh, the, the example that Mate mentioned before about suspending the tax number of an organization, that's an excellent example of this. And then outright restrictions on funding. Being uh, categorized as foreign agents is, an, is the next type. And all these can accumulate to attacks concerning the liberty and the safety of the person. So there are challenges, but uh, the good news is that we heard about many tactics uh, and strategies how to tackle those challenges. And these are all interlinked. In response to the stigmatization of, of civil society, one um, action or, or an answer to this challenge can be something that I summarized as mainstreaming human rights. We talk quite a lot about the distrust issue, the, the issue of distrust, and I think the recent uh, uh, results of the European Parliament elections clearly showed this distrust, how uh, a generation grew up after, even after the system change in, in Hungary, and because of, the, because, of this, uh, because of this chance was not utilized in a good way, people don't believe in human rights, they don't understand why the rule of law and fundamental rights are even important to them. And um, the trust was also mentioned in, in other forms, how the ACLU capitalizes on the deep-seated understanding of human rights in the United States. Mainstreaming human rights is crucial uh, in our times to make a our fellow citizens understand why our work affects their life and why it can be important to them. And of course it relates to all the other challenges that we, that we, uh, that we will hear about. Um, we have to show why it is important for all, for all citizens in our countries, um, that, that w the work that we are doing. And actually that, can, that speaks to the, the fundraising uh, uh, or the funding challenges that, that were raised also. And, and related to that, to the mainstreaming of human rights, we, we talked about active citizenship as well today. Um, in, in times when any public act, activity is characterized as, as, um, as something criminal that, uh, or, or uh, suffers ban, then it's, of course, it's difficult to mobilize, mobilize citizens to speak up against policies that harm them. But this is our job to, uh, to focus on them. Uh, we heard about um, strategies how to, how to tackle this. One of them was to not to shy away from documenting and exposing these, um, these uh, human rights violations. And the other one is uh, changing uh, the ways of communication. And we heard about from our colleagues from ACRI how they are trying to reach out to new constituencies, how they are trying to reach ultra-Orthodox Jews who are uh, not yet the supporters of ACRI's work. That's, that's a big challenge, but that's something that we really have to, have to tackle in the coming years. And another challenge that I identified is segregation. We talked quite a bit about um, how governments, uh, based on claims about sovereignty and, and, inter and the national interest, try to restrict um, the work of civil society organizations within the country and also international corporations and international networks such as the INCLU. But we, we shouldn't forget that these are very, um, very beneficial and instrumental to our work, both within the country and outside of the country. We heard from our Egyptian colleague about how to spread geographically and what results it did have, of how the ways in which they found their, con the, their new constituency outside of the capital 
also meant the expansion of, of the thematics or of the topics of the organizations and how it made them realize that there's no Chinese wall between civil liberties and the economic and social rights. I think this is something a very important takeaway from today that we have to consider. Um, and also another ally is not only domestic civil society and international human rights organizations can be an ally, but also uh, there are other professionals who are similarly attacked by increasingly authoritarian governments. We heard about uh, the restrictions on the internet in Russia and also uh, restrictions on freedom of speech in Israel and for that matter also in Hungary. And I would like to remind everyone to Arya Nayer's words who was the former head of the Human Rights Watch and the Open Society Foundations who wrote a very interesting book about the human rights movement and it starts with the parallel between investigative journalists and human rights activists. So it's important to find our allies and, and, uh, and that's why we are also very grateful to the INCLO members that they are here today and showing their support on this very important event to us. Another type of challenge that I, I could identify concerns the rule of law versus the law of rule. How uh, the, the available human rights mechanisms, independence institutions narrowed. Hungary is a great example of that and we, ha we heard from Mate in great detail about this. Um, there are a couple of questions to be raised. One of them concerns whether small successes uh, are worth it whether we should really engage in a case-by-case -case handling of human rights violations, whether we should try uh, the, our national courts, our institutions that we don't find uh, um, part of a democratic system and, and try, to, to, uh, try to win our cases in front of them, or are we just legitimizing a system or should we, instead of this case-by-case -case approach, focus on, some, on the, the system as a whole? Um, we also heard another, another strategy to overcome this challenge is uh, re reliance on international mechanisms and also about the restored constitutionalism. Um, and moving beyond the, the, the traditional human rights tool, the naming and shaming, and turning more towards policy work that uh, human rights uh, organizations can do. But I think we can draw the conclusion that as human rights watchdog organizations, we are working with the law and we have to use the existing law. However, we have to adhere to higher principles, such as in the case of, uh, of Hungary, instead of basing our uh, arguments purely on the fundamental law, we always try to find higher principles, in, for example, in the European Convention of Human Rights. And another type of... Um, challenge was uh, the restrictions on funds and how can, how can we tackle that. And I think if we succeed in the first three, then, then uh, we are granted for, for this challenge as well. I, I started with saying that I'm proud that I'm the executive director of the, human, uh, of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. And it makes me proud because these attempts to, to silence us really show our importance. And I think the challenge here is to communicate it in the right way and, and show it to the citizens, our fellow citizens, why, why is it uh, important and make them understand. And finally, because this became at the end a very candid discussion, I think we have to also look at our, uh, ourselves uh, as human rights activists and, uh, and also not to forget to take care of ourselves, to, uh, to protect our stuff from, from burnout. And, uh, an excellent way to do this is such international networks because we can really see that we are not alone, not, not only in Hungary we are not alone, but we are not alone in the world. And I'm very grateful for this to you. So with this, I will, I will close. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer.